Welcome, everyone, to the PFF Fantasy Podcast. Thank you all for joining us once again, as this marks just the second podcast episode from myself, John Macri, fantasy analyst here at PFF, and of course, my co-host, lead analyst here at PFF, Nate the Great. Nathan Yonke, how goes it, my friend? Uh, it's going well. Happy that we made it to episode two. We didn't get canceled for <laughs> the first episode, so that's always a good sign, but happy we'll be talking about quarterbacks here, so excited to talk some quarterbacks. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it's always a good sign that we didn't get canceled after one episode. I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and making sure that that didn't happen. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to talk about quarterbacks as well. I appreciate you taking the time off your your vacation time to come on here and and keep this keep this rolling for us. So uh, yeah, it, it should be fun. We got a lot of uh, a lot of guys to talk about, a lot of interesting names, and some discrepancies in the rankings as well. So that'll make for some good conversation as well. It should be a should be a fun episode. But uh, yeah, we we started uh, the this podcast off. I, I guess it was yeah last week with our first episode, which was a look at some of the top post draft risers and fallers according to ADP. So if you haven't listened to that, be sure to check it out. We covered some key names affected by the NFL draft and dove into the the who, what, where, why's of their updated ADPs. But for this episode, we're we're taking a, a much broader approach to the topic at hand and and for the next few episodes really as we start our 2023 positional previews and we're going to kick things off with the most important position in sports. Kickers. Oh, no, wait. Uh, quarterbacks. Yeah, that's the one. Quarterbacks. Uh, we're, we're talking about quarterbacks today. So what we've done is we've each tiered off our QB rankings to better provide kind of a breakup of, of where we value them amongst similar players heading into 2023. It should also give people an idea of where they can move to maybe another position group at the end of one tier and before kicking off another one and um that's that's kind of what i personally like about the tiered rankings is that it gives us a chance to kind of extract different values from within those tiers not always having to take the top player in each tier but maybe addressing another position first in the draft with the chance to kind of come back and get a player ranked lower within the same tier who should offer a very comparable outlook in a slightly later round. How about you, Nate? Do you, do you prefer a tiered ranking or, or are you more of just like a straight up rankings guy? Um, I'm good with tiered rankings. I kind of like looking at the positions against each other to see where they're ranked across the board to see kind of since my quarterback tiers end up being here are the quarterbacks I have ranked together. And then I have a big gap of running backs and wide receivers. And then I have more quarterbacks. So at least with quarterbacks, it's pretty nice and easy to see where the breakoffs are between quarterbacks. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, same here. I, I, I like to see that kind of the differences basically between each grouping and, um, and we should also note that we're working off standard PPR scoring for for all these positional previews. And um, as we go through the different positions and stuff, we might mention like super flex or half PPR or tight end premium, stuff like that on occasion. But, you know, for the most part, we didn't want to add too many caveats uh, to the scoring settings in order to just kind of keep it fairly simple and and all encompassing, basically. And um and then also for context, since we might reference like fantasy finishes and points per game, the average points per game for like QB1, QB2, 3, 4. Um, since 2013, I pulled it up here just to kind of get a, a better, uh, some context and in, in what those um, points per games are. Uh, equate to but qb1 since 2013 has averaged uh, to, uh 20 and a half points per game so that's qb's 1 to 12 in fantasy finish then you go to qb2 it's about 16 and a half points per game qb3 is 14.1 points per game and qb4 goes down to 10.2 points per game so more of a split maybe between the first and the second tiers and that that fourth and third tiers than in the, the middle is what we're kind of seeing. So we're there's going to be some high-end QB2s around the fringe of that QB1 range. Once we get away from that range, they start to kind of clump together quite a bit before dropping off into kind of those backup filler options that uh, only play a few games per year at the most. So um, I think in you know standard like 12 team leagues or smaller, there should be more than enough capable fantasy options at the position. Uh, and we'll cover a lot of those guys today. Um, and try to f help you find the ones that you know can maximize their production opportunities basically and hopefully identify who those guys are as we go through them so 
let's kick things off uh, with each of our first tiers. We have the same three players in the first tier, just in slightly different order. Uh, Nate, what does your QB1 tier look like for 2023? Yep, so I've got Josh Allen, number one, Jalen Hurts, two, and Patrick Mahomes, three, which... I don't think having those three quarterbacks is going to be controversial. I think, like you said, the two of us agree. And I think if you look basically across the industry, those are the three that are going to be at the top of basically anyone's list at this point of this year. Yeah, for sure. Nothing too spicy there. We, we got the same three players. I got Jalen Hurts as QB1 and Josh Allen as QB2, but also Patrick Mahomes QB three. So, I mean, it at least does give us like our first kind of debate right off the bat as we have a different QB one, but the same QB three. So we'll talk about why we went with each guy as our 2023 QB one. Um, I'll let you kick us off here and uh, pump up the tires of Mr. Josh Allen. Sure. So Allen, first thing I like about him is he's been very consistent these past few seasons. He's had at least 24 fantasy points per game each of the past three years. And there's only been three other quarterbacks in a season that's gotten at least that many fantasy points per game over these past three years. So he's been much more consistent than any other quarterback has been in terms of fantasy production in that time. Um, A lot of that is due to his big play ability, um, leads the league in big time throws per attempt, uh, touchdowns per completion over the past two seasons. So those are both very helpful for fantasy production. Um, He's also been very good in terms of scrambling with the football. Um, He has 15 touchdowns off of scrambles over the past five seasons, which is more than any other quarterback has in the past 10 seasons. So the fact that he's done it in half the time is pretty uh, remarkable. And then you look at the weapons that have been added to Buffalo this offseason. And Dalton Kincaid, who arguably the second best tight end prospect of the past five years coming out of the draft. So I think he will certainly help in the slot, I think, Earlier in Allen's career, he definitely relied on receivers in the slot and they weren't as helpful for him last year. So I think that'll be a big boost in that direction. And then I want to also bring up uh, Deontay Hardy, who has played on a small sample size with the Saints over these past few years, but has been very efficient in his time. Um, Among 230 wide receivers with at least 295 routes over the past five years, and he ranks top five in yards after contact per route, yards after the catch per route, avoided tackles per route, which all of those are fairly related to each other. But you'll see guys like Debo Samuel, Cooper Cup, and Antonio Brown on those lists. Uh, you'll also see Rondale Moore, uh, LaVisca Chenault, and Albert Wilson. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag of the quality of wide receivers that have been that efficient per route after the catch. But I think there's definitely a chance that he does something in Buffalo. There's also a chance that he might not do much as a receiver. So I think it's at least a wild card for what he's capable of doing this year. I like it. Good points there. A little bonus Deontay Hardy content as well. Um, I know there's there's quite a few fans of his out there too. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to argue, right? As Josh Allen for, for QB1. I mean, I'll, I'll do it anyways for the, the sake of discussion here, obviously. But um, yeah, for me, I, th- these guys are all super close within that top tier. I say it's probably the tightest top tier for me across all positions. Um, I, I did have a couple minor tiebreakers and going with Hertz over Allen. Um, first one, just kind of being the rushing upside for Hertz, I think is slightly greater than with Allen. We saw that last year with Hertz averaging almost 10 rush attempts per game, which includes scrambles and, and removes QB kneels. So I should say that here at the top, as I, I reference it throughout is that, um, where we're including scrambles and removing QB Neals in those rush attempts, but 9.8 per game. And that QB sneak on the goal line obviously figures to be a big part of their success again this this season. Um, Allen was at 6.7 rush attempts per game, still great, but uh, you know a significant gap there in favor of Hertz. And then looking at him as a passer, you know, I, I'd argue that Hertz was as efficient as a passer, um, even though he didn't necessarily have the big play numbers that Allen did, like you referenced, you know, he at least limited turnovers. He had the third best turnover worthy play rate in the league at 1.9%. Allen had one of the higher rates as well at 4.2%. But even though, you know, his, his average depth of target at 8.9 yards didn't get as high as Allen either at 10.1, it at least allowed him to be a bit more accurate with his passes. And that's why he had that higher adjusted completion rate, higher, higher catchable pass rate, which is, 
even better with arguably, you know, the best receiving weapons in the league in, in AJ Brown, Devontae Smith, Dallas Goddard, even De- DeAndre Swift coming over now because it allows them to kind of add value to those passes as well because of what they can do with the ball in their hands. And I mean, I, I, I love both options. I'm sure fantasy managers would be thrilled to land either one of these, these top three. Um, but yeah, for the sake of these rankings heading into the season, Jalen Hurts is uh, going to be QB one for me. Yeah, I will mention with Hertz, I'll be interesting to interested to see how much he continues to do those quarterback sneaks. He mm-hmm. sneaked the ball 30 times last year, which ended up uh, converting almost every time and included, I think, five touchdowns in there. And that's still 10 more sneaks than any quarterback that we've seen over the last 15 years. So that seems like a number that should be regressing just because we've never really seen it before. But I'd also be curious to see um, with Penny coming in there at running back, he's a little bit bigger of a back than Miles Sanders was. So if they take it, if they want to protect their quarterback a little bit more, if they start giving him a little bit more of those short yarded situations, and that's also partially why he sees so many rushing attempts per game is he's seeing like two of those quarterback sneaks a game where he's only gaining two or three yards, which most of the time isn't too important for fantasy, except for when he's at the goal line and about to yeah. score those touchdowns. So I think that'll be really interesting to see how many rushing touchdowns he scores this year. And if they start giving it to their running backs more after the upgrades that they made this off season. For sure. Yeah. That's a good call. Definitely something to keep an eye out on. And yeah, I mean, I, I know they unlocked the the cheat code last year with it. The, what did they call it on the PFF NFL pod? I think the, the double cheek push or something like that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, 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 it might surprise me if they go away from it too much, but yeah, I, I see what you mean. Definitely could be some regression in that usage there as well. So valid concerns. Um, so yeah, that it's, it's a tight, tight end or uh tight, top tier there for quarterbacks so uh we'll see how things kind of loosen up here a little bit as we go into tier two uh i know you broke up your your six tier two guys into a group a and b and i have i think five guys together for my tier two so who are your uh tier two fantasy quarterbacks Sure. So uh, like you mentioned, I broke it up into two groups just to make it match up more nicely with yours. But really, I'd probably have them as two separate tiers. In the top, I have Joe Burrow, Lamar Jackson, and Justin Fields. Then I have a bit of a gap. And then Justin Herbert, Trevor Lawrence, and Dak Prescott. Nice. Um, Yeah, I I kind of clumped them together a little bit. You're right, though. It is kind of they could I could see this being split up as well. I, I kind of called it my choose your fighter tier, like a high end rusher or a high end passer. Um, so I got Lamar Jackson as my QB four, Joe Burrow as QB five, uh, Justin Fields as QB six, Trevor Lawrence as QB seven, and then Justin Herbert as QB eight. So I, I think this is a good one to kind of pull up because I mean, looking at Lamar versus Burrow, that was one of the ones we're we're different on here but it was definitely one of the ones I went back and forth on the most between these two guys probably more than any quarterback ranking I I have um I have a feeling listening to your argument in favor of Burrow it won't take me too much to convince me to change sides here but I'll happily fight for Lamar on this one since that's where I ultimately landed but um yeah, just kind of starting out with the obvious, but we, we definitely did see a decline in Lamar's passing ability since that MVP season. And that that's basically the main reason why I couldn't put him in that top tier, even though he does have the elite rushing ability and tendency to add a lot of fantasy value with his legs. He averaged 8.3 attempts per game, which was third most among quarterbacks just last season. And, you know, we haven't seen him maintain sig- significant success as a passer uh, yet. And, and I guess that's, the main thing for me and being optimistic that he'll get there, just looking at this new offense with Todd Todd Munkin coming in and potentially leaning on the pass a bit more, especially with better receiving weapons to join Mark Andrews. They brought in uh, Odell Beckham Jr. They drafted Zay Flowers in the first round. And then you have uh, Rashad Bateman going into a key year three with a chance to break out. I, I just think having more of a commitment to the passing game is only going to be a positive for Lamar and we'll see him kind of return closer to that MVP form than than we have in the past and you know even though they've talked about kind of scaling back his rushing opportunities as well as well it's it's still Lamar he's going to scramble he's going to make ridiculous plays with his legs on a weekly basis that threat is always kind of going to be there Uh, so I'm not overly concerned about a lighter rushing workload for him this season I think he'll always find a way to add value with his legs and 
with a potential step up as a passer. That's where we could see him kind of maybe edge out Joe Burrow just slightly for fantasy. It's so close though. And, and I love Burrow. He's maybe my favorite quarterback in the league. So I'm, I'm happy to switch it up in drafts and take alternating shots on either guy here. How about you? What's got, uh, what's got Burrow ahead of Lamar in your ranks? Yeah, I think this a lot of this probably has more to do with Lamar than it does with Burrow, just because I think we can probably agree that we expect a lot of the same out of Burrow this upcoming year. The coaching staff's the same. He still has the top same three wide receivers at the top of the depth chart, uh, largely the same offensive line. They did add Orlando Brown at left tackle. The biggest change was probably at tight end where they have Irv Smith now rather than Hayden Hurst. So definitely expect a lot of the same for Burrow as we saw last year, and he was one of the top quarterbacks last year. So I think out of Burrow, you're getting a fairly consistent guy. Um, I could probably agree uh, Lamar Jackson might have a little bit more upside, but I also think there's a lot more risk with Jackson than there is with Burrow. Um, For one, he's missed at least a few games each of the past four seasons. So while we don't think a player who missed some time in one season is necessarily injury prone. But once you see it year after year after year, you start to get a little bit more concerned. So that is somewhat of a problem. And then looking at where his fantasy production has come in the past, we know he's an excellent runner, but he has actually been pretty efficient as a passer um, in terms of fantasy production, at least um, 0.52 fantasy points per passing attempt over the past five years, which is six best for quarterbacks. So that's actually been fairly good. Um, some of that is because with the Ravens, you expect them to run the ball so much so that defenses are expecting the run. So when they do pass, it's a little bit more of a surprise, which definitely helps his passing production. Since even when he steps back to pass, defenses have to be prepared for him to scramble as well. So um, I expect him to still do well on a per pass basis. He just scores so much more fantasy points when he's rushing the ball uh, 0.78 or Yeah, 0.78 over the past five years, and that was even a little higher rushing last year and a little lower passing last year compared to the last five-year sample size. So um, he scores more fantasy points when he runs, but with the new offensive coordinator, he is expected to pass more. It does help the Ravens' offense in general that they added the receivers, but if he ends up throwing more than in the past and rushing less than the past, then that could lead to fewer fantasy points in general. Um, It'll really depend on if those rushing attempts get taken away from like J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards. If that's where they lose more of the rushing production, then Lamar Jackson could be okay. And we've seen him have one of the best quarterback seasons we've ever seen from a fantasy quarterback. So he's definitely capable of that quarterback one production. I'm just worried that he might become too much of a passer and lose some of that fantasy value, even if it's helping the Ravens win games in real life. Nice. Yeah. And, and yeah, just hoping he stays healthy too, right? Like you said, the last couple of years, he's, he's missed some time. So that that's really hurt him as well. But yeah, if, if he can stay healthy, if he can develop, a, you know, continue that um, or get back to that form of being a high level passer, then, I mean, I love it. I, I hear you. I, I definitely think, you know, that we might not see as much rushing, but I think that, it, you know, it's always going to kind of be there with him. So um just optimistic, optimistic for Lamar for 2023. Um, but yeah, let's keep it rolling here into tier three. And, and now we start to Actually, see. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I want to talk about Dak Prescott, who I have in tier two. Yes, and you've yes. completely left off of tier two. That's true. <laughs> go ahead. Yes, for sure. So uh, Prescott, someone who um, as of two or three years ago, was one of the best fantasy quarterbacks in the league, was quarterback what, two, three years ago, and then he had a ridiculous like 27 fantasy points per game, um, what, two years ago, and then he suffered that injury. So he only played a few games then and then hasn't been quite as good these past two years, but he still has been around a fantasy starter level of play. And I think this year he should be able to improve where he was last year. I think um, having Brian Schottenheimer at offensive coordinator could help. I know people have talked about them losing their offensive coordinator and that being a bad thing for Prescott, but um, with Russell Wilson, Schottenheimer did a great job as offensive coordinator. Wilson was quarterback nine, quarterback four, and quarterback six in those three years. Um, The one year that Schottenheimer was uh, the court offensive coordinator for Andrew Luck. He was quarterback for that year. So Schottenheimer does have a decent history of having top 10 fantasy production out of their quarterback. Uh, they ended Brandon Cooks, which will definitely help build the 
fill the void that was missing from Amari Cooper last year. Um, if you look at PFF grade over the past few seasons, Cooper's only slightly ahead of Cooks. Um, our Sam Munson had an article recently of the top wide receivers in the NFL, not necessarily fantasy, but just real value. And he also had Cooper just slightly higher than Cooks. So I think um, Cooks can definitely help the offense get back to where it was. And we also have to remember C.D. Lamb, who's the most important part of that receiving offense, only 24 years old. So typically, if you look at how wide receivers progress throughout their career, um, they're still getting noticeably better at that age. So I expect Lamb to continue to take steps forward to improve as a wide receiver, which should also help Prescott's production. And I'll add that the players that they lost, Ezekiel Elliott, Dalton Schultz, um, neither of them had PFF grades over 70 last year. Um, Schultz only had the one season where he really graded highly and Elliott really hasn't graded all that well since 2019. So while they did have some losses on offense, I don't expect them to be huge losses for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good call. It, that's fair. I mean, for me, like I did push Dak a little bit further down. I have him as uh, QB 12. So he's in this next tier for me. So still just kind of on the fringe of that, that QB one territory. So not, like overly low on him, but more maybe, I guess, skeptical of him after last season. So one of the things that did worry me was the turnover worthy play rate at, at 4%, which was, you know, the highest of his entire career. And, and we tend to see that be one of the more stable metrics for quarterbacks, even over like the positively graded throws. So it, it, it certainly hurt him last year with 15 interceptions tying for the league lead, despite only playing those 12 games. So it's not so much that it, it scared me out of the QB one range. I'm definitely willing him to keep him inside that top 12 though. And, and treating him a bit more like a treating last year, a bit more like an outlier year uh, for him more than anything else, because that hasn't really been typical of him. Um, and then you, like you said, he's got the weapons um, there as well still, and, and potentially even an upgrade. Um, it's just the turnover stuff. It, you know, some of the play from last year is it's just enough to kind of give me pause and push him down a little bit in favor of some of maybe like the higher upside guys that I'd uh, personally prefer to take shots at, at the quarterback position. Once we get outside of the top eight or so, um, which we'll we'll get into here in a second. Fair enough. So if we want to get into tier three, um, my guys, uh, Tua is at quarterback 10 with Miami, Daniel Jones, quarterback 11, Kirk Cousins at 12, and Geno Smith at 13. Yeah. Nice. So, yeah, so I put uh, Anthony Richardson. So this is this will be a big difference for us. I put him as QB9, uh, Daniel Jones as QB10, Geno Smith as QB11, and then this is where Dak Prescott comes in, QB12, and uh, Kirk Cousins I put in there as well at QB13. So uh, which one do you want to start with here, Richardson? Um, or yeah, I'll let you one? start with Richard then since I just talked all that about Dak. So <laughs> let's hear why you're at sure. Richardson at quarterback nine in his rookie season. Sure. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is where I kind of like feel like when I'm looking at the quarterback rankings and, and how I want to attack the position, I feel like I can start maybe taking some high upside swings here without maybe seeming too crazy, although depending on how you feel about Richardson, maybe it is, but um, I, I've bought in. I, I know I'm not the only one either. We talked about it last episode as he rose into kind of that QB one range in, in ADP. So, yeah, the, the big reason for me why I have Richardson ahead of guys like Dak and Kirk Cousins, for example, leading off that third tier is just I've become enamored with the upside. I, I can't stop drafting him in that range. I'd just rather take the swing on a guy who could post high-end QB1 numbers versus playing it safe with like a Dak or a Kirk Cousins. Um as my QB one. And then it allows me to maybe play it a little bit safer with my QB two, for example, at least, and and lean on somebody like I don't know, like a Derek Carr or Jared Goff or, or Matthew Stafford, somebody like that later on in the chance that it doesn't work out with it, with Richardson. But yeah, the upside for me, is, it's given me googly eyes for Richardson, especially, you know, uh, pairing him with Shane Steichen, who I think knows exactly what he's getting from his athletic and toolsy quarterback. I, I think he's going to play to his strengths early and often in his NFL career, which means, you know, potentially a lot of easy completions, but more importantly, taking advantage of that at elite athleticism and, and getting him on the move, getting some of those goal line sneaks for him, like they did with Jalen hurts in Philadelphia. Um, Jonathan Taylor managers aren't going to love that, but just let him rack up the rushing yardage without having to put too much, 
of an expectation on him as a passer, similarly to Justin Fields last year and, and Hurts the year prior, uh, where they finished in the QB one range because of their rushing ability. And, um, you know, if, if you're in a league that, for example, like says like that that penalizes quarterbacks for incompletions, for example, or um, or maybe even a better example is like the all 22 fantasy platform um, where they use like PFF grades and actual on field performance for scoring versus typical like fantasy box staffs stat stuff which by the way like shout out to those fan to that fantasy platform go check out the all 22 guys if you're interested at all 22 underscore pff on twitter but um anyways the reason i was talking about that like those kinds of leagues i'd be less bullish on richardson than i am in typical fantasy scoring leagues but for now i mean I'm kind of all in. I've I've got an addiction addiction to Anthony Richardson. I think I maybe need help. Maybe I need an intervention. Please tell me where I'm wrong. <laughs> well, I definitely think he has a top ten quarterback upside with that rushing ability. I tried to look at some um, similar guys that have that rushing production in their rookie season. Some more recent ones that come to mind: Kyler Murray, Josh Allen, and Lamar Jackson. Uh, Murray was quarterback seven his rookie season. Allen quarterback twenty one. Uh, Lamar Jackson only started the second half of his rookie season. So if you only look at that second half, uh, he was quarterback eight over those last eight weeks of the season, I think it was. So you'd have, have two of those three quarterbacks in the top 10. I think Kyler Murray is probably the most like the ideal situation here. And that I think both Josh Allen and Lamar Jackson had a bit more talent around them where Kyler Murray wasn't going into that great of a situation in Arizona in his rookie year, and he still managed quarterback seven production. So I think that's probably where I think the height of where Richardson will get his first year will be is that quarterback seven range. I don't think Richardson is the same prospect as Murray was when Murray started. I thought Murray was a better quarterback heading into the NFL. So Richardson has that working against him. I think for me, it's I don't see that quarterback top five upside. Just since if you look at all the quarterbacks who have been top five these last couple of seasons and you look at the receivers they have to throw to, yeah, a lot of them have a ton of rushing production, but they also have that passing production. Jalen Hurts got as good as he did this year, partially because he was running and doing quarterback, or quarterback sneaks more than anyone else but he also has two of the best wide receivers in the NFL and one of the best tight ends in the NFL. So that's a perfect situation for a quarterback right there where you have the rushing and great receivers, where I think a lot of those teams, their second best receiving option is better than the Colts best receiving option right now. So I think Richardson definitely has a bright future in the NFL. I think dynasty I'm high on him, like a lot of other people and you are. And I think eventually they can get more talent around him. I just don't think the talent is there for him to have that top five upside in his rookie season. Yeah, I, I think that's fair. It's a good call too. like saying, you know, Kyler Murray was definitely a, a more polished quarterback kind of coming in the league as well. And um, yeah, the weapons for sure are going to be, are going to be a big difference. I, I guess I picture more kind of like in the Justin Fields mold from last year, even though Justin Fields put on like a ridiculous uh, rushing number, uh, it was like 1100 yards and he didn't even really start rushing until like week seven or something like that. So that that I guess what I'm trying to comp him a little bit to, it's definitely on the more optimistic range as well. So I, I could see it going either way. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm willing to bet on it and then just kind of maybe take like a, a shot on a safer option a little bit later just to kind of balance it out a little bit. But um, yeah, I like that call uh, as well. Um, but how about Tua? You you have him here in uh, in this third tier as QB ten. I know I'm like a slightly lower on him at QB fourteen, I believe. So uh, what's got you in on Mister Tonga Bailoa? Um, I thought he did well over the stretch during the season. I know he had a little bit of a slow start and then was injured more later in the season, but he was at least a top eighteen quarterback each of his last nine starts. Um, he had four games where he finished as a top four fantasy quarterback, which is something only seven quarterbacks did last year. Uh, definitely has the most important part of his uh, offense back with Tyree Kill and Jalen Waddell. A lot of that offense looks the same last year. A lot of consistency in terms of the coaching staff. Um, almost all of the offensive players that were there last year are back. A couple of players that played significant playing time, but the only player who left who had a PFF grade above 65 was Teddy Bridgewater. So um, that's not a problem for Tua. Um, he is only 25 years old still, so I still expect him to be improving as a passer. So having that improvement and the weapons around him 
And that consistency, I think, will be big for him in that I think he should be able to finish in the top 10 as long as he's able to stay healthy. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I know we got like that kind of four spot difference there in, in the ranks. So it is enough to kind of, you know, one of us has him as QB1, the other as QB2. But yeah, I guess maybe the skeptic is the skepticism for me that comes in, I guess, and maybe this is galaxy braining it a little bit here, but I, I had a tougher time not thinking there will be at least like kind of some regression from to it, you know, just he made so much of his bones on, on those big plays in 2022 more so than he has in his career and not by like a small margin, but a pretty significant difference. He went from, you know, 6.8 yards per attempt in 2021 to 8.9 yards per attempt in 2022. Uh, he went from an average depth of target of 7.4 to 10.1. So another huge jump there. And then that big time throw rate increased significantly as well from 2.4% to 4.3%. So all pretty substantial leaps. And, you know, I read referenced it earlier about negative plays being a bit more stable year to year than positive ones, because a lot does still have to go right for those big plays to hit more so than the negatively graded plays, which are more isolated uh, on the quarterback. So there's definitely a part of me that, that believes those big plays are going to still be there. And that's because of Tyree kill and Jalen Waddle. Um, having those two as your primary weapons is always going to help uh, and, and allow for big plays to be a factor. And, and they alone should kind of keep that regression from hitting too hard. I, I still think there's going to be some drop off, which is why he comes in maybe more as like a high end QB two for me uh, versus low end QB one. And, I, I, and I'm also a little bit concerned about the concussions. I, I'd be lying if I say it wasn't always, you know, a concern in ranking him higher. I, I try not to let the injury history play a big part in my ranks, but there are a few players who do scare me a little bit. And, and he's certainly one of them now. That's fair. And like you mentioned it with Richardson, where if you're drafting him, you probably want a quarterback that you can trust to be more consistent to also fits in there. So uh, before we head to the next year, I'd like to hear a little bit more of what your strategy is for quarterbacks heading into this year. Are you definitely trying to get one of those tier one quarterbacks that we were talking about? I know drafting quarterback late is a pretty common strategy that people have. So I'm curious what your strategy is for quarterbacks heading into this year. Yeah, I think the way that I've approached it kind of so far is waiting a little bit on quarterback and and trying to take kind of the, the swings on those higher upside guys. Um, Justin Fields is going a little bit higher, but he's been one that I've, I've tried to target. And then obviously Anthony Richardson. So those have been the two guys that I think I've drafted kind of the most this year um, and then playing it a little bit safer in, in rounds like 12, 13, somewhere like that, trying to get like a Derek Carr or somebody, um, Jared Goff a, a little bit later. But for the most part, I've been trying to take some bigger swings at quarterback this year um, in, in like the seventh or, or eighth round usually. How about you? There, I've been uh, in the past couple of years, I've been more waiting at quarterbacks and then picking two that are outside of the top 10. And that's typically gone okay. But that's something that I don't think will work as well for fantasy managers this year compared to previous years. If you look at just the quarterbacks that we were drafting top 12 in recent seasons, um, yeah, we have the Patrick Mahomes, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, Herbert, and Hertz, who were all uh, ranked highly heading into last season. They all did well last season, and we were happy to have them. Uh, Dak Prescott, um, probably a tier lower than that. But then we see a lot of quarterbacks who um, we were drafting highly recently that we won't be able to draft as high this year. Um, Tom Brady obviously retired. Matt Ryan and Drew Brees were similar top 12 fantasy quarterbacks of two or three years ago who also are no longer in the league. Um, we have Kyler Murray, who we drafted highly last year, but is injured. Trey Lance, who we drafted highly last year, who's a backup now. And then we had Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Matthew Stafford, and Ryan Tannehill all have their worst season in years and all at 34 years or older. So while we can still draft all of them this year, we're not drafting them as highly this year and not expecting as much this year. So we had 12 starter worthy fantasy quarterbacks in recent seasons where I don't think we have that many anymore. Um, we had 11 people average 20 fantasy points or more at quarterback um, in recent seasons. And that was down to six last year. So I'm definitely targeting at least one of those top two tiers of quarterbacks somewhere, someone in the top, nine or so top eight or so of both of our rankings and trying to make sure I have one of those, because I think 
there is a pretty decent drop off from the quarterbacks we were talking about in tier two and those that we were talking about in tier three and lower. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great call. And and yeah, I I, I would definitely feel a little bit more comfortable. It is, it gets a little shaky once once you get into kind of like the Daniel Jones, Geno Smith territory, right? Because there are question marks about those guys and how sustainable their success from last year might be. So um, yeah, definitely understand that you want that kind of stability. It it will be interesting to see what Aaron Rodgers does at New York, um, see if he's re-motivated there. But uh yeah, it, you're right. It is, it's a little bit, uh, a little bit messier a little cloudier at the quarterback position this year than in years past um yeah and i think like the guys that we just talked about in tier three the daniel jones geno smith kirk cousins guys that we didn't go into too much but i feel like those are quarterbacks that in other years we probably would have been talking about them mm -hmm. as the top backup options and now we're talking about them as uh starting options because there just aren't 12 better guys than those guys yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, let's go into let's go into tier four here. Uh, we have yeah, yeah, tier four. Who do you got in tier four? Sure. So I have uh, Deshaun Watson at quarterback fourteen, Aaron Rodgers quarterback fifteen, Russell Wilson quarterback sixteen. All three of those guys that we were talking about, I was just talking about where they used to be elite fantasy options, and now not as much. Um, then Jared Goff, quarterback 17, and then I have Richardson all the way down at 18. Um, like you were saying, you have that high upside for them, but like with Watson and Rodgers and Wilson, all of them could bounce back, and we've seen them be top five quarterbacks before. And Goff is someone who's an interesting, um, always been somewhere around this range, but has the weapons that could be better mm -hmm. this year. For sure. Yeah. So the way I have it here, um, I got Tua. Uh, so kicking us off at QB 14 and then Russell Wilson. Yeah. QB 15, Deshaun Watson, QB 16, Aaron Rodgers, QB 17. Then I went Derek Carr, uh, QB 18 and Jared Goff, QB 19. So I guess Derek Carr is the only one uh, that we have different. Well, other than Anthony Richardson, who we covered already, but Derek Carr is the only one that uh, I have a little bit earlier than than you do and for me I, you know he's he's one of my like kind of like that favorite safe bet quarterbacks that i guess that i'm pairing with like a lamar or anthony richardson as we get into those kind of later rounds and you know he was qb 17 last year with mac hollins as his wide receiver too now he gets a a fresh start in new orleans i think him and chris olave will make a really strong connection but then maybe more importantly, if Michael Thomas can stay healthy as well and be a key contributor, um, that could play a big part in additional success there. You got Rashid Shaheed emerging last year as a really good deep threat. Um, we'll see what happens with Alvin Kamara as well, but there are some decent pieces in place there to kind of keep Carr afloat, even without much rushing upside for him and let him kind of finish within that same range as last year, QB 17, probably more likely QB 20, I think for, for me and, and how I'm kind of projecting him. So definitely feels like a, you know, like a safe bet. Um, Derek Carr, you know, if, if he was an actual car, he's probably more like a Volvo or something. I don't know if Volvo's still considered the safest car. Maybe that's an outdated analogy. I, I don't know enough about cars, but anyways, the point is that I, I just feel more comfortable and, and safe with car. And if I'm taking a bigger swing on my, my QB one earlier, it's nicer to have him, um, as a fallback option. So with that strategy in mind, he's a bit further up the ranks for me. There and um in my tier four, I was focused a lot more on quarterbacks who have that upside to be potential top five, where I don't see Carr getting there. He's been quarterback 17, 13, 13, 17, 18, 19 <laughs> each of these past six seasons. So uh we know he's not a fantasy starting quarterback in single quarterback leagues. Um, you did mention his weapons, but he also had Devontae Adams last year mm -hmm. and Darren Waller when Waller was healthy and Hunter Renfro is a decent wide receiver as well. So he also had options in the past and didn't do as much with them. Um, Andy Dalton was quarterback 22 with them last year, and I expect Carr to be an upgrade over Dalton, but I don't know how much of an upgrade that is. So yeah. it's one of those quarterbacks where if we're talking like super flex leagues, then definitely happy with Carr because I can trust him to be worthy of being one of my starting quarterbacks there. Mm -hmm. um, and then the one thing that I will mention that's probably more in your favor than it is mine here, but um, the Saints do have one of the easiest schedules this year. Um, them and the Falcons just 
really don't have that many strong opponents that they have to face. So um, Carr at least has that going for him and definitely helps him become even safer of, yeah, he'll probably end up being better than where we have him ranked, but I just don't see him having that upside to get in the top 12. For sure. Uh, yeah, that's fair. And yeah, definitely shout out to, you know, moving from the AFC West to the NFC South. That's a, <laughs> a substantial upgrade for, for, <laughs> for car that hopefully works out in his favor. Um, so yeah, good points. Uh, let's look at, uh, yeah, nothing too, nothing too different in, in the, that middle tier there, but, uh, how about, uh, tier five here? So, um, who did you have, uh, in tier five? Sure. So this is, I have a number of quarterbacks here, are basically most of the guys that we expect to be guaranteed to have the starting job if they're healthy. I have Kyler Murray at quarterback 19, uh, Matthew Stafford, quarterback 20, Bryce Young, 21, uh, Derek Carr, 22, CJ Stroud, 23, uh, Jimmy G at 24, Kenny Pickett, 25, and Jordan Love at 26. Nice. All right. Yeah. For me, it is uh, Bryce Young, QB 20, uh, Kenny Pickett, QB 21. Then I put Trey Lance up in this uh, range, QB 22, Matthew Stafford, QB 23, Jordan Love, QB 24, and CJ Stroud, uh, QB 25. So what do we got here? What are the differences? Um, you got Kyler Murray up in this tier. This is where, yeah, you have Carr down here and then you have Jimmy G. I think those are probably the biggest differences. Yep. And then you having Lance, but I can start with Kyler Murray. Sure. And the reason I have him here at 19 is um, if you're in a 12 team league, for example, I expect those who drafted a top six quarterbacks to not be targeting one of the top backups. And a lot of the teams that do not get one of those top six quarterbacks to be targeting a quarterback in tier four. So if you did miss out on one of the elite quarterbacks, I would try to definitely get two quarterbacks that are in tier three and four, just because Hopefully one of them has that upside to potentially get in the top five. But I think once we get into tier five, we're really talking about guys who it's either you drafted an elite quarterback and you want another one on your roster or for whatever reason, you have deep enough benches that you can get three quarterbacks. So I think Murray is definitely a risk with his injuries, but we know how good he is when he's healthy. I uh, was quarterback seven in points per game last year, uh, four the year before that, and five the year before that. So um, a lot of the quarterbacks, you're just trying to think, okay, what situation can they be a top five fantasy quarterback? And for Murray, all it is is his health, where some of these other quarterbacks, it's a lot harder to find that scenario where they're able to get to top five right away. Uh, for example, Bryce Young, someone who we both have near the top of this tier, um, he has to be the quarterback that we think he is immediately, and he has to gel with the coaching staff right away, and they don't have the same receiving options as several other teams, so he has to gel with those receivers and have them have some of the better years of their careers, so there has to be a lot to go right for some of these other quarterbacks to be top five, where Murray probably won't be at least for the first half of the season, but maybe he is by the second half, and then you have an option to either trade Murray or trade the quarterback that you drafted early and get a good return out of him. And outside of that, if you drafted Hertz or Mahomes or Allen, you might not really need to draft a backup quarterback at all. So maybe I'm not considering any of these guys. So I have Murray here because of that upside, even though there's that huge injury risk that he might not play much, or we don't know when he's going to play. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good strategy. I mean, the upside, obviously, like you said, is huge. I, I guess for me, it was just more about the the injury than anything else. The eight to 10 month recovery time from the torn ACL, which happened in week 14. So December. Um, right. So I guess that the earliest he'd be returning then is probably around week five, somewhere around there. And that's at the earliest. So I, I guess I'm not as optimistic as that and, and definitely a little concerned. It'll be a little bit longer, especially considering you know, the Cardinals aren't likely to be com competing for a playoff spot this year. I don't know that they'll be in a hurry to rush him back. So, yeah, I pushed him outside of the top 24 range just for that reason. But I do like the strategy there that you said, um, if you are looking for, you know, a guy with upside that you could even maybe trade later on. Um, and, you know, you could kind of employ the reverse strategy of, of what I was talking about earlier and going with a safer bet at quarterback, like you said, and then and then taking a swing on a high upside guy like Kyler uh, later in the draft. So, 
Yeah, he's he's he'll be an interesting one. I'll, I'll be interested to see kind of how he recovers and when they get him back on the field um, this season, because obviously that makes all the difference in the world, right? Yep. All right. And the uh, 49ers quarterback situation, I think, is oh. a good one to talk about next. Since you have Trey Lance 22, I don't have any 49er quarterback in this year. I have all three of them in my next year. So yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to touch on why you have Lance at 22? Sure. Yeah. I, it's, it's, it, I mean, it's kind of a crazy situation, but I'm just having like a really hard time believing the 49ers aren't starting Trey Lance if he's healthy and if he doesn't absolutely, you know, crap the bed in training camp, for example, but I'm just kind of working on the assumption that they won't rush Brock Purdy back from injury. So it'll give Lance a chance to prove that he can hold that starting job as long as he doesn't get hurt again. Um, definitely has the rushing upside to make him a real fantasy asset and that arm strength with some development, you know, could be massive as well. I I, I would just be shocked if they don't start him. I'm not overly concerned about Sam Darnold. I mean, if they're not going to start him, then then at least trade him. Maybe there there are teams out there in need of a quarterback. The Bucks maybe um, that could be fun. It could be the second best Tampa Bay Trey out there, obviously behind Trevor Sikama. <laughs> um, but yeah, really, I mean, they traded first three first round picks for the guy, and now they're they're going to give him a not going to give him a shot to start if he's healthy. I don't know if that makes sense to me. I, I I hope we see him get a chance because it just adds more excitement to the position, not just in the NFL, but for fantasy as well. And that that's what it's all about, right? The good times. Um, but yeah, it's, it, I guess like for me, like it's, it's a similar strategy to ha- to what you have with Kyler Murray there, right? Is, is getting a guy like this with high upside um, after nobody's really paying attention to him um, that you could stash and, and hope it works out. He gets a chance to start or, you know, gets on the field early in the, in the season with the potential to, to move him for, if you do have a good QB one option, but um, yeah, I, for that San Francisco quarterback room right now, I mean, I just, I, I know it's, I know they've talked up Brock Purdy. I know he's probably the favorite to start. I just don't know that he's going to be able to start the year healthy. Um, so that leaves Trey Lance as kind of the obvious choice for me, but it might not be so obvious in San Francisco. Fair. I might just be more optimistic about Purdy's health. So obviously the more that we learn about the health of these quarterbacks, the more that'll change our rankings as we progress through the off season, since these rankings will definitely change between now and when a lot of people are doing their fantasy drafts and we'll probably cover quarterbacks again sometime between now and then. But we've also heard good things about Lance in general and um, becoming a better thrower this off season. And it's just hard for me to know how much of that is legitimate versus trying to hype him up so that they can trade him for someone. So, or for a draft pick and then where he lands will definitely influence what we think of him in fantasy since a lot of what we thought of him so far um, leading into seasons is his rushing upside, but also the weapons that San Francisco has with having Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk and George Kittle and a very good offensive line. So and I'm Christian McCaffrey now too. We weren't thinking of him a year ago and we were having Lance as a top 10 fantasy quarterback. So if he ends up leaving San Francisco, it probably won't be for the best situation in the world. So we might not consider him quite as high as we did a year ago at this time. So um, I could also just be a little bitter that he was my quarterback in basically all of my leagues last year before he got hurt. So <laughs> That might be just a little bit of me not wanting to go through all of that a second year in a row. I think I literally had him in every one of my leagues that I was setting my lineup lineups in last year. So yeah, definitely had that, but yeah. And Nathan scorned. You don't want to mess with him. (laughs) Trey Lance. Um, Yeah, man, that's, it's tough for sure. It's such a weird situation. We didn't see enough of him last year, even to get a really good sense of if he has a chance to win that job. So it's just kind of a wait and see as we progress through the off season here and hope for the best. But yeah, for now I'm, I'm a little bit optimistic and that'll probably change. Um, We'll see if it gets better or worse uh, as we get uh, closer to the season here. Yep. And Uh, then the one other difference that we had in tier five, I had Jimmy G at quarterback 24, where you have him a tier lower. And at this point, this is probably mostly for super flex leagues. And if you drafted one of those top three quarterbacks, you probably really don't need a backup, but I comparing him to some of the other quarterbacks that we have in this tier, a lot of it's just the receivers having Devontae Adams and Jacoby Myers is a better duo than basically all of the other options that the guys that we're talking about in tier five have. I know we just went through the 
really good option San Francisco has, but Adams, arguably the best wide receiver in the league. Myers, I believe, also made the top 30 in Sam's list that went on the website on Wednesday. So um, I think it's mostly the receivers for him. I know Jimmy's probably is similar to Carr in that we've seen him be an average fantasy quarterback for several years while healthy. Um, Jimmy G did grade a little bit better than Carr last year, and they were basically the same grade wise over the past two seasons. So um, it could probably very well be some of the same for him. So I, he's the kind of guy that I have him ranked at 24 because I don't see a huge amount of upside for him, or at least like some of the rookies with young and Stroud, they could end up being excellent as a rookie. But I could very well see Jimmy G being a top 20 fantasy quarterback this year, just without that upside of reaching the top 10. So not having that top 10 upside drops him down a little bit. So if I was just doing straight projections, I'd have him higher. But since these are rankings where we can take into account upside better, I have him down at 24. Okay. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, for me, I I think just in, in where I've ranked him, I think I'd just rather take a shot on maybe some of like the kind of like the breakout candidate type guys, like a Kenny Pickett, for example, who, you know, could take a step this year. He showed some promise last year, um, has some potential for even positive touchdown regression as well. I, I think I like that a little bit more than rolling out Jimmy G for a couple starts this year at the, at the most. And yeah, he's got the weapons and everything. And um, I just, yeah, he's never really done it um, for, he's not you know a great fantasy option to be you know if i'm going to use another car analogy he's kind of feels like the like a ferrari with 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 like a prius engine or something like that but um yeah you know looks great probably not going to win you any races or anything so again another one of those safe guys um that we can we can throw in there with uh with a Derek car and and in that range but yeah that that's tier what is that tier five tier, tier six five, yeah. for some of us yeah um all right, let's let's round it out here. What what do you got for tier six? Sure. So tier six, we have Ryan Tannehill to start the list, the one quarterback on this list who probably has a decently safe job, just not any of the receiving options, and is pretty old at this point. And they drafted the rookie that could very well take his place sometime during this season. Then Mac Jones at 28, Purdy at 29, uh Desmond Ritter at 30, Baker Mayfield 31. Trey Lance at 32, Jacoby Brissett 33, and Sam Darnold 34. Nice. Yeah, so for this one, this tier, I basically called it the the injured Kyler Murray and low floor quarterback tiers. I put, yeah, Kyler Murray at the top, QB 26 for me. Um, then I put Sam Howell uh, at QB 27, and then Jimmy G, QB 28, and then Mac Jones, 29, Desmond Ritter, 30, Ryan Tannehill, 31, Baker Mayfield, 32. So, for this one, it looks like we're betting on basically just different guys to win the Washington starting quarterback job. Um, I mean, I went with Howell. You went with Jacoby. Honestly, I don't have a strong inclination of who who it will be either way, but I do know that if it is Howell, I'd, I'd much rather have him for fantasy than Brissett. I, you know, I included him in my kind of low floor quarterback tier, but I think he's maybe the only one outside of that, the injured Kyler Murray, obviously, that doesn't fit that label. Um but he's there just on the chance that he doesn't win the starting job. But if he does, however, he could be really interesting for fantasy as a quarterback who who did flash a ton of rushing upside during his final year at UNC, averaging 12 rushing attempts per game, um, averaging 8.4 yards per attempt and posting over a thousand yards on the ground. And obviously I know, you know, college is a completely different game, but that, that's still a lot. And, and even in one start last year, we got to see him kind of flash that just enough to get me excited. So, you know, he posted 35 rushing yards and a rushing touchdown on, on four rushing attempts in, in week 18 last season. So wasn't afraid to continue using his legs in his first NFL action, which I think bodes well for him kind of keeping that up. And then he also showed a decent amount of promise as a passer at UNC, earning a 91.5 passing grade in 2020 and never lower than an 81.0. So I think the commanders would be smart to see what they have in him to start the year. And if it doesn't work out, then go to Brissett. But I think the potential is worth worth the shot over Jacoby, who we kind of know what he is at this point. But um, yeah, if you think Brissett is the favorite, then obviously you're, you're going to take him too, right? Yeah, and we're talking so far down this list that even in super flex leagues that we're not talking about starters. So this is just potential upside at some point in the season. I wouldn't even be surprised if Howell ends up being the starter at the start of the season, but maybe doesn't keep the job. There's just 
we've seen Tom Brady and Tony Roma and Brock Purdy do well of being fifth round or later or undrafted players, but we've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of players getting drafted that late that never do anything in the NFL or maybe start a couple games here and there. So for me, a lot of it's just not trusting a guy who was picked in the fifth round, who they only started him once in week 18 with the quarterback situation they had in Washington last year. So um, Brissett, someone who was quarterback 17 in Cleveland, um, heading up to when Deshaun Watson took over as the starting quarterback. So Brissett did pretty well in Cleveland last year. I'd argue Washington has better receivers than Cleveland had last year. And I also think they'll be much more pass happy than Cleveland was last year. So I could see Brissett being a borderline top 12 fantasy quarterback at the ends of being the starter there. And while I don't think Either one will probably start the entire season for Washington. I can just see that upside of Brissett maybe being an okay player to have when your quarterback has a bye week, where Howell, I don't think he will do as well if he's the starter, where Brissett, I see more of the upside if he's the starter. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Um, All right. Anybody else of interest? Any other bonus names you want to add or... I don't think I have anyone else outside of the top 34. Like some of those guys <laughs> that we just listed. Um, yeah, there's a chance that they don't start and it's pretty clear who would be the starter if they're mm-hmm. not starting. So obviously like any of the 32 starting quarterbacks in the NFL deserve some consideration, especially in super flex leagues. But I don't think I have any dark horses like you do. Okay, fair enough. Yeah, I just wanted to put one kind of name out there. Um, so I included Clayton Toon, uh, who's with the Arizona Cardinals, um, talked about, you know, kind of the concerns with I have with Kyler coming back for a lot of the games this season, which leaves the door open between Clayton Toon, who is a rookie fifth round pick out of Houston, and then guys like Colt McCoy, David Blau, Jeff Driscoll, that they kind of have a chance to battle it out to start the year. I really like Toon's chances. You know, when I pulled the the staple metrics for this year's quarterback class um, from the past two seasons, Toon shined across the board. He was consistently uh, within the top three, along with Bryce Young and CJ Stroud on every single quarterback metric, um, that the stable metric that is, which focuses on, you know, how a quarterback performs within structure. Uh, he also has a lot of starting experience, having played over 3,000 offensive snaps in college, uh, back-to-back 91-plus passing grades in each of the past two seasons really accurate as well at a higher catchable pass per game rate than most quarterbacks in this class at 33 and that's with some decent rushing upside as well he averaged eight and a half rushes per game in 2022 for over 600 yards on the ground so uh, i'm definitely adding clayton tune at the end of every super flex rookie draft and even in those deeper kind of one qb leagues he, he's been like a must add for me because of that potential and I, I, you know, if I had to pick a 2023 Brock Purdy for me, it's Clayton Tune. That's so fair. There, there we go. So we'll leave it off a, a little spicy there to wrap things up. <laughs> um, but hopefully, everyone has you know a better grasp on this year's fantasy quarterbacks, who to target, who to avoid, etc. And, and if you have more questions, you could always reach out to Nathan or I on the Twitter at PFF underscore Nate Yonke and at PFF underscore Macri. We're always help, happy to talk fantasy football and try and help people win their leagues. And uh, speaking of which, you can find all of our written content and rankings on PFF.com. Uh, Nathan, what's some of the stuff that you got up there going right now? Yeah, so I think most recently has just been some of the big ranking articles. So probably more helpful will be some of the stuff that you've been putting out this week. I know you've been going through your tiered rankings. And if there's any guys that you were hoping that we talked about that we didn't end up talking about, there's a good chance that John wrote about it in your quarterback tiers article that you had earlier this week. So definitely go ahead and check that out. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely put out my, um, I got a chance to put out the 2023 rankings into tiers. So running backs, quarterbacks, wide receivers are all up on the site right now. And I believe tight ends will be up tomorrow. So by the time you're listening to this, most likely everything will be up on the site by the end of this week for everyone to dig into. Um, but yeah, thanks again to Nate for doing this with me. Thank you all very much for tuning in. We hope you'll do so again next week as we dive into another positional preview. Uh, well, what, what position you want to cover next week? What do you think? Um, I think running backs make sense. Quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. Feels like a good nice. order. And like you were saying at the top, maybe we'll find a way to get kickers in sometime before the start <laughs> of the season. 
Love it. All right. Awesome. Yeah. So we'll talk running backs next week. That'll be fun. Uh, Make sure you tune in for that and we will break down that position for you as well. So until then, peace out.